So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest, C2A. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name's C2A. Cito, for those that may not have already heard about you and your music, can you just give us a bit of a brief sort of overview of you and your sound? I spend way too much time on the internet. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm ostensibly a sort of instrumental progressive metal solo act. Um, the way I started was just writing and recording music in my bedroom and releasing it online. And I've pretty much been continuing doing the same. So, yeah. Awesome. So how long have you been actually sort of playing guitar then? Is it from a sort of like a quite early age or? Yeah, so I've been playing guitar since I was about 12. Um, so it was, a, it was like a high school class where they introduced you to a variety of different instruments. There was the, the crappy high school pianos. Pretty sure many of you have played on those. Um, trying to find whatever ridiculous sounds you come with. Um, there was the bass guitar, the drum kit, but for me, the instrument that stuck with me was a guitar. And um, I don't know, it's, it's one of those things you can't really quantify, um, but I just stuck with the guitar and I've been playing it ever since. So since I was 12, so you've been playing a guitar for about 16 years now, yeah. All right, cool, and did you have like particular influences or idols that helped that sort of decision? Kirk Hammett from Metallica. <laughs> And now you're sharing the same stage that he has played on. <laughs> wow. There you go. No, no, for real, though. I mean, like, I, I guess people joke about Kirk Hammett and the fact that he uses seven wahs in a row. But um, it's, it was um, back then, you know, for me, like anybody who played guitar that was, you know, big into metal music was a big influence. But uh, as I got older, it was, um, I got more into, like, the, the sort of shred guitarists. So guys like Joe Satriani, guys like Steve Vai, guys like Paul Gerber, Ingve Malmsteen. I was like wait, this is actually possible on electric guitar. You can actually do these kind of things. So um, that, that, kind of pushed me, that kind of pushed what I thought was possible in the instrument. And then uh, I discovered Dream Theater, and that got me into prog, and John Petrucci was a huge influence on me as well. Um, so all these different guys um, were a huge influence on my playing. And then, you know, uh, the you know, the new wave of guitarists, like, you know, Tosin Abassi, uh, and, and guitarists like Misha Mansur from Periphery doing their own thing. Um, and you can notice there's like a hard cutoff line between them. Like everybody from that previous generation of guitarists worked in studios and had other people recording their albums for them. And then you name the people who are kind of known for playing guitar now, and a lot of them do it by themselves. So that's, that's something that I find quite interesting about the current crop of guitarists. Yeah, I mean, do you think sort of technology has reshaped the way that people can make music and actually start getting their ideas down? You know, I mean, what was your sort of first kind of setup really for starting to sort of work with, you know, getting ideas down and, and capturing that performance? I mean, um, I was always trying to record stuff in, uh, in high school, although record's a, a strong word for what I did back then. But um, j just, to, just to take it back a little bit, like, you know, how is technology enabled what you did, like when I was in high school, I don't think what I did now was possible. I don't think the tools to record the music were there. I don't think the ways to release your music and I don't think the online platforms are there. So for me, recording was kind of like a revelation. The idea of just being able to, instead of just you know trying to remember everything you came up with, you could record it, you could record song ideas and that would be your reference for, for what to work from. But then, as I got older, when I got into university, you know, there, there was, I discovered how to actually, you know, what a, what a DAW, what a DAW was, and how to actually, you know, go about recording properly. And the, the, the idea that I didn't need a record label, I didn't need to go to a studio, I could do it by myself. I could take ownership of that entire process and release music by myself putting it online through pl uh, platforms like Bandcamp, you know, putting up songs and singles on YouTube was kind of mind-blowing to me. Um, and that was, I guess, when I started out doing that, you know, that was when the first wave of bands of, you know, I, th I think, you know, doing a lot of the DIY in their own room recording, but still, uh, you know, polishing out 
you know, still churning out uh, professionally, professional sounding records was, was starting. And I'm not going to claim that my first album, Cassini, sounded in any way, shape, or form professional. But being able to do that was just a game changer. Like, in every, like, I wouldn't be sitting here, I wouldn't have a career as a musician if the technology, the platforms to record the music and release it weren't there. Yeah, and do you mean think that's sort of fundamental to how you built your following online? I mean, you touched on talking about YouTube and, and sort of how that kind of came about, but it's quite interesting. Do you think that sort of without the technology, that following wouldn't just wouldn't have been there? Yeah, well, the, 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 the most interesting, and I might get quite philosophical here, but the most interesting thing about the technology is that the traditional gatekeepers of music, you know, the record labels, people on radio, press, press companies, all these people... They're, they're being completely bypassed. Like the, the, what people were listening, what people are listening to, especially in my scene, but you know, in other scenes like the electronic music scene or even in hip hop you know, on SoundCloud, like the, the labels, the, the, the radio stations, the press are not telling people who to listen to anymore. People are going out and finding music on their own. So that, that, that's, you know, that must be like the most encouraging thing for any of you who are r creating music is you can put your music out there and if it connects with people and they can find it, you know, you're, you're instantly going to make fans and no one's told them to listen to you. They've done it by themselves. So for me, the, the, I've never, you know, pushed my music to be on, on radio. I've never, I've never been on a label. I've, uh, I've not pushed my stuff out to, you know, press outlets. So the fact that there are people who still listen to me and who, who enjoy my music is, I think, solely just because they're able to find it. Because the music's there, and it's just up to them to find it. And it, it's also humbling because you know they they choose to listen to my music. It's their it's their choice, and they've uh, they've chosen to they've chosen to engage with it. So it's um, it's both amazing and also humbling. The so people sort of they sort of, most of the people that enjoy your music. Do you think they kind of stuck with you through other releases? I mean, as you sort of learned your you know your technique really when making music, or do you feel that it's from more recent kind of advancements or recent mixes and album releases, etc.? Um, I mean, I I see everything. I see people who have been following me since my first album. I see, you know, people ten years younger than me who are getting into my latest releases. I mean, who, who's heard of who's heard Senpai EP? I'm really sorry, um, but they're the people. Like, I I can put out something as wacky as an as an EP inspired by anime, and there are people that are still they're, they're still listen to and say that you know C2 still done that. It, it, it's it's fucking stupid that he did, but you know he's still done it. Um, so yeah, it's just um, people have engaged at all different levels. I think also social media means that they've learned, they've learned how I am as a person as well. I'm not just a faceless entity pushing out music for them to consume. You know, I'm, I'm there, I'm communicating with them, I'm responding to messages. They're, you know. yeah, there's a connect there directly with the, the people that enjoy your music. Yeah, I mean, like, um, if, I was, you know, if I was 10 years younger, like, you know, just, finishing university, uh, just finishing high school, and you told me that you know, I could add John Petrucci as a friend on Facebook, and he occasionally will not ignore my messages and respond to them every once in a while. Like, I would have, like, bitten your hand off for that opportunity back then. Um, and I'm not claiming that I'm, like, John Petrucci in any way. He's far more manly and muscly than I'll ever be, <laughs> um, as well as having a far more magnificent beard. But, like, people have that connection with me, you know? Like, they, I might not have a, the same impact that Dream Theater would have had, but, you know, hopefully my music is connected with people and... I'm able to communicate directly with people who have been, you know, affected by my music. That's interesting. So the idea of your sort of recording processes, I mean, do you want to sort of talk a little bit about how you sort of capture ideas and where do you start really with, you know, is it a drum track or is it no more of a riff or an idea? Yeah. Um, well, the, the actual songwriting process for me is kind of, it's va it varies. Like sometimes I'll have a melody on guitar. Sometimes, you know, I'll have a riff on guitar. Sometimes I'll have you know, just a bass riff. Sometimes I'll have just a rhythm I want to work to. Um, one thing I've been doing is, um, is what I've been calling vibe-based sound, uh, sound songwriting. And um, it, it sounds total BS, but the idea is just I want to capture a certain mood or feeling, and I'm writing to convey that mood or feeling. Um, so there's different ways, but 
it almost always is just with me on a guitar. I'm trying to like incorporate piano into songwriting as well, but it'll be me with an instrument sitting in front of my doll and just, you know, trying out different ideas. And then if an idea sticks, I'll track it. I'll write some basic program drums to go along with it. And then I'll record guitar and then record bass. And eventually a song will be built from that. I'll be, I'll, I'll just be sitting and recording as I, as I write. Um, so that's how I've always worked. I've always written and recorded as I go. Um, which means that the process to anybody from the outside looking in seems incredibly painful and tedious because I have an idea and I'm going to track it and anybody who plays guitar knows that the first time you play anything is absolutely awful. Um, so anybody that thinks I'm good at guitar has never seen me try to track a lead before. <laughs> so, but it's just that, you know, I'm able to work the way I want to. I'm able to capture the ideas I want to. And... Um, it's just incredibly liberating, I think. Yeah, I think the idea of having that sort of technology, you know, in your home or in your studio, wherever it may be, you know, and you can spend as much time as you want to get that lead down. You know, it's not like time is money, you know. If you don't get it done in the first two, de two hours, like, we need to move on to the next idea. So I think that's sort of a nice way that you can really kind of sculpt, your, you know, your sound, definitely. So taking sort of your production on the next step, so when you've kind of, uh, you've got your idea down, do you produce like all, everything from then on? Do you start sort of doing more kind of advanced mixing, etc.? I would say my mixing techniques, advanced would also be a strong word. Um, a, lot, a lot of people message me and ask me about, you know, how do I, how do I mix and how do I, how do I do anything really when it comes to production? And I guess I was sort of, I was lucky and unlucky in a way that I didn't really have people to ask. So for me, a lot of it was just trial and error. It was just trying different things out. Um, so a lot of the things I know might be completely wrong uh, to, according to conventional wisdom, but are just things that I find out that work. Um, but honestly, like a lot, of the, a lot of the things that I know are incomplete. They're just things I find out through trial and error. And I'm always trying to improve my mixes. I'm always trying to learn more. The great thing is online, there are so many resources to try find things out. Um, there are so many people who are willing to listen to strangers' mixes on the internet and give them... Um, hopefully, positive and constructive critique, and not just say it's shit. Um, that that's happened to me before, by the way. So don't get discouraged when it does, if it does. But you know, for me, it's just like it's it's not like I want to be more advanced. I I want to keep learning. Like everything I do mu with regards to music, with regards to mixing, producing, mastering, is is all a learning process, and I'm just trying to learn more. And it's the it's the ever repeating incremental improvement cycle. Um, and I think, you know, for me, it's like I've, I've always enjoyed learning things. So every time I, every time I stumble across something new, it's, it's exciting, it's fresh. And so sort of looking at it back the other way, do you think it's kind of changed, improved, or adapted your songwriting, sort of looking back at the original idea and things like that, kind of hearing it over and over, et cetera? I, th I think one of, one of the most important things for me with regards to like listening to songs that you're writing over and over again is that you have to, for, for me, the music I write is the kind of music that I'd want to listen to. And a lot of young people in bands, you know, they want to stick to a certain sound or a certain scene. And I'm almost baffled by that because I kind of feel like just do whatever feels right, do whatever is fun. And I think that's the most important thing is that what you're recording especially if you have to listen to it over and over again, and when you've tweaked a compression ratio or uh, attack figure for the fifth time or the 15th time in an hour, you know, it's hard not to get sick of what you're writing and recording. But I just feel that when you are writing, when you are recording, you know, just, it sounds cheesy, but be true to what you want to, what you want to produce musically. Be true to how you're feeling, what you want to express. Um, with regards to me it's like you know i'm okay with it i'm okay like i i'm apparently very good at dealing with high amounts of tedium and monotony um so i'm okay just going over the same thing over and just adjusting fine details interesting would you like to share any sort of tips with um basically some of the people in the audience that you'd wish you'd been told sort of when you were starting out and what's your sort of tip with recording you know what's that one thing you think if only someone had told me that five years ago? Um, 
don't master the way I did. Um, no, uh, I, I think like just in general, the, the, the things that I learned the hard way, and I like, I kind of feel that maybe people don't have the patience, maybe their expectations are too high. The first thing is just to manage your expectations. Like learning how to mix, learning how to produce your music is not easy. Uh, it takes longer than people think. Um, so you have to manage your expectations. Think that I'm I'm go I'm aiming to improve my mixing over this over this, the space of months as opposed to weeks, for instance, um, and being able to settle for being able to settle for you know a good enough because my entire mixing and musical career has been settling for good enough because the good enough was it was my best effort that I could do at that point in time. And every, every mix, every release, all the music I've written is a reflection of me at that point in time. What I felt was good enough, what I felt was a reflection of me. So it's just about managing expectations, finding that good enough for, for, for whatever it is is you. And sometimes that good enough might not be that high, but it means the next time you do something, that good enough will improve. And again, it's about that gradual incremental improvement cycle um, the other thing is don't be afraid to fail because you learn the most when you fail. Um, anybody who does home production will have tried something and it would have sounded absolutely horrible and ruined the entire mix. Um, but you, you did that and it, and it didn't work and that's fine. You learned something that didn't work. Or you tried something, you weren't afraid to fail and it sounded amazing. And then there's, there's something that you could add to your... Um, to, that, that you could put in your back pocket in terms of what to learn to mix. So I would say, you know, embrace failure, not, not in the way that I have by watching anime, but by trying new things and putting yourself out there and taking risks. Okay, yeah, no, interesting. So sort of leading in from, you know, your day-to-day -day really, so you're obviously full-time musician now. Um, I mean, can you believe sort of that, that that's something that, you know, happened for you? Because you were saying you didn't always, you know, you weren't always a musician basically, were you? What did you do before you kind of made it, if you like, in music? I, I spent far too much time in this city with people in suits. Um, that was something, I, I mean, I worked as a, at Deloitte as a sort of junior management consultant in technology which is as far from music as you could expect. And at university, I did a physics degree. Um, basically, the technology has enabled my career to exist in the way that it does. When I imagined musicians back in high school, I thought, you know, people in, on labels, people in bands, people touring all the time. And none of that has happened in terms of the way I expect it. I've been fortunate enough to be able to tour. I've been, you know, fortunate enough to be able to sustain this career just through you know music sales and through streaming revenue and through you know people like direct support, um, but all of that is just the rec as a result of just you know the recording technology enabling me, the platforms being there to push my music out, and you know the social media to you know communicate with people and to you know spread my you know spread the word about my own music. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so did, leading on from that, I mean, do you found, uh, did you find that you sort of were able to get things like endorsements and things like that? I mean, obviously, we as a company, Focus, right, wanted to work with you guys, um, you know, and when we heard sort of about the relationship, we were really sort of keen to pursue that. I mean, there are other companies that you work with and, you know, you have a relationship with. Okay, so this is where I shill all the companies I work for. Um, uh, was that, a, no, no, it wasn't a boo, it was a woo. Okay, that's fine. So you're okay with me shilling. Uh, so the guitars I use are mayonnaise guitars. They're a Polish guitar brand. Um, again, with high-end boutique guitars, like it's a, totally a preference thing, whether you, you, know, you like mayonnaise or one of the other boutique brands. But for me, I played a mayonnaise Regis 7 string and just fell in love instantly with the instrument. Like that was just, it was just perfect for me. And ever since then, I've had a unhealthy obsession with collecting guitars named after a condiment. So these are the two, the, this is a Mena CTS 6 Pro. Uh, it's got the Floyd Rose bridge because I, I hate myself and I really like spending an hour changing strings. And I've got the Duvel 7. So the seven string is just, you know, I've always enjoyed playing seven string stuff. So I like having both sixes and sevens. Um, I'm using Jim Dunlop picks. These are the new flow picks. Um, you probably, if you follow me on social media, you know I bang out on about them all the time, but these are the picks I've been using. These are the one millimeter ones. Um, and I'm using the Dario NY XL strings. Um, this is a nine to 42 set on the six string and I've got a custom set on the seven string. And uh, 
funnily enough, I use Focusrite interfaces. <laughs> oh, that's excellent to hear. Which one in particular? I have, a, I have an 18i8, um, which this, this is like, you're going to hate me for saying this, but uh, it, it's kind of broken. So the left channel breaks if I don't put pressure on the volume knob. And I thought about asking for a replacement, but I actually put an elastic band <laughs> over the interface. So there's constantly pressure on the volume knob, and now it works perfectly. OK, well, if you've damaged it in transit, we'll have a look at it for you, no problem. <laughs> no, that's awesome. But yeah, I mean, I said it's amazing kind of the sound quality that people are getting from those interfaces and sort of seeing where they end up is, is quite amazing. It's you sort of see that little red box in a lot of places. Um, yeah, no, it's awesome to hear. No, is there any other questions? I mean, obviously, we're sort of having a lot of questions from yeah, us. Uh, Please, is there the any point. sort of out in the audience? Yeah, I think there's a mic coming your way. Hi. Um, Hello. I wanted to ask about, like, you know, the, like, it was a while back you put on your Instagram the Nintendo Wii thing about Harmony. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't really get it. Like, the, you know, you know when you were learning, like, talking about how you were learning the Harmony and whatnot. Yeah. And then also about how, you know when you do, like, the really fast, like, sweepy, shreddy stuff, right? When you write it, how do you know how it's going to sound? Like, I don't get that. Right, so I'm a big theory nerd, so I, 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 I like learning theory, um, but I don't like the way theory is taught, if that makes sense. Kind of theory is taught as a, as a mean, as like, you just need to learn it. Like, here is, here is some books and, here's some books in theory, and here are some Adam Neely video, uh, videos, and you, you learn theory. I'm, I'm pretty sure they don't tell you to watch Adam Neely videos, but... Um, Adam Neely's awesome. <laughs> he is awesome. Um, but... For me, the, the idea with theory is that I want to understand the relationships between notes. I want to understand the relationships between notes and chords. I want to internalize how that sounds so that I can reproduce it at will. So for me, theory is, it's like recording. It's a tool I use to express what I want to do musically. Um, so in terms of the second part of your question, when I'm playing the fast shreddy stuff, it's because I know what the notes are. I know how the notes sound. I, I mostly know how the notes sound. Um, and I know how the notes sound in relationship to chord. I mean, like, one simple thing you do is, like, write a simple four-note melody, but change the chord that's underneath it, and the melody sounds different regarding to chords. Or take, like a, like, a pop song with, like, a simple melody, but just change the chords underneath it. That's technically reharmonization, which is the, in reference to your, the first part of your question. That's reharmonizing it. You're changing the chords and the harmony underneath it. So... What I was doing with you know, the lick video where I played the lick, do 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 do, and wrote a different bunch of chords. I'm just, first, I'm just using the diatonic harmony rules. So these are the chords that you're allowed to use because you're in C minor. And then I'm thinking, these notes are in C minor, or these notes are in the melody. I'm just going to add whatever chord has those melody notes under it, which meant that it was wacky and weird and didn't sound like you know, how. I, I, like a regular diatonic sound would, like what like you hear mostly in Western music, but it still kind of made sense because the notes and the melody were still in the chord. So that's like the most like condensed basic version of it I could do without actually sitting down and teaching you harmony. Um, but that's basically what I was doing. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one at the back there. The mic's just coming your way. Hey, man, a uh, big fan... I guess this is a three-parter. <clears throat> One is what moment when you were learning how to do pinch harmonics was like the catalyst. We're like, aha, now I get it. Now I can do it forever. Uh, so it was it's like pinch harmonics are just this kind of, the kind of thing you have to practice. But like the catalyst is just realizing, sorry, like, so like, like I said, it's just something you have to practice. The catalyst was just when I was able to just do it on demand. So I could just hit a note and I could get the pinch harmonic. Also realizing the, 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 where you hit the harmonic actually affects the pitch of the harmonic. Because um, that, that, that's a whole different thing on like harmonics and that's a wave physics thing. But um, understanding where those particular harmonics are. But yeah, it's just getting the technique right and knowing where to hit the, hit the, knowing where to hit the string was where like, it just clicks and you're just like, okay, I can do this in demand. Uh, the second one would be, uh, how is getting a new dog? Because I know you have Studio One now. 
Mm-hmm. So how would that, how does that help to your uh, music production? I mean, for one, it works. <laughs> uh, I, used, I used to, I think I was like one of like one and a half people in the world that used Sony Acid. I was the half, because I am. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I came back from tour in the US and I opened up Sony Acid and it's like, oh, I want to like, adjust my mix. So I opened up a plugin chain and it crashed. I said, like, okay, let's, let's turn it off and turn it back on again. And I did that and it crashed again. And I was like, yo, fuck this. I don't want to work with this anymore. So I just, I just shopped around for doll, uh, dolls. And I was like, okay, um, so Studio One seems like the one that's most similar to my workflow. You know, I went and bought it, downloaded it, started working on it. And honestly, like the most important thing, because all dolls do the same thing. To the, like, that, the thing that is the, the preference thing with dolls is just the workflow. So for me, the Studio One workflow suits me to a T and I can work the way I want to. I've not had to change the way I work for the DA, for the DAW. Like I can just keep working the way I want. So that it's been relatively easy, actually. The third one. Sorry for all the questions. Uh, uh, how has your job that you left to become a part-time or a full-time musician helped you with just being a musician? Um, I think it's it's made me appreciate. It's made me appreciate the time I have to dedicate to music because. Um, especially in that world, the corporate world, to get up the corporate ladder, you have to sacrifice more and more of your own time. So the fact that I have all this time now to dedicate myself to music and music-related things is amazing. Um, I think the one good thing about that job is like um, the music industry is actually quite, it's, it's quite opaque. Like when you, if you're an outsider looking from the, from the outside in, it's difficult to make sense of it. And you know, um, a lot of the things, a lot of things happen behind closed doors. Um, so the one good thing about my old job was that I worked with people a lot and I got to, you know, I got good at judging people's intentions and, you know, seeing if people were for, like legit for whether, whether I could trust them, whether, you know, there were, there were people that were worth, you know, me investing some time into, you know, getting to know them. And I'm lucky because a lot of the people I know in the music industry are really cool people um, who I'm happy to call friends. Um, but I, I like uh, there are there are there are unsavory characters in the music industry, like in any other work or any other field. Um, so, but just being able to judge people, being able to, you know, tell if they're worth spent like spending time with was is is another good thing that came from my old job. But I'm happy to have left it, obviously. I think there's one at the front here as well. There we are. Thanks. Hi. Um, so recently, like a lot of bands in the progressive metal world have been quite open about like the financial difficulties and like making a living out of like that kind of music. So I just wanted to ask, like, what's your take on that? Like, what do you think about the bands opening up about it? And like, have you experimented like similar things? So, one thing I will say is, any band that says that it's very difficult to make a living from music will almost definitely be on a label. So. I mean, this, this is true. Um, people say that you can't make money from Spotify. People say that you can't, you know, there's, the, the money is not there in the industry. Um, but that's because everybody's still under the impression that you need to be on a label in order to do music. But half the thing that labels are for, putting music out there, is done e- more easily and more cheaply by online distribution platforms like um, like like Bandcamp or like you know services like TuneCore or Spotify uh, or DistroKid that push your music to iTunes and Spotify, so half their job's done by online services that will do it at a fraction of the cost that a label would. Um, the the other thing that um that that pushes bands to the financial difficulty is that um is touring because there's a lot less money available for bands in touring, but the costs of touring are still the same. Um, this is something I've learned very much the hard way. When you're an opening act for, for a band, you're not getting a lot of money every night, but you still have exactly the same costs as the headline band who are making more money than you. Um, so touring is incredibly expensive, especially if, if, if you factor in overseas touring and things like visas and overseas you know, transport and accommodation. Um, so it, is, it can be financially difficult, but there are ways that people can make more money from music. And you can already see it with bands like Periphery going independent. They've, they made their own label to release their own music. 
uh, Protest the Hero went independent a couple of years back with a, with a crowdfunder because their label dropped them because they weren't happy with them. And then suddenly Protest the Hero raised $300,000 on a Kickstarter because people want the music and people would prefer to give the mu money directly to Protest to make it as opposed to having it, giving, having it through a middleman. So there are realities about the music industry that affect all of us. But I kind of feel like the first step to making a living from music is taking control of you know, recording and distribution, like taking that into your own hands and becoming independent. I'm, I'm always been an advocate for being ind independent. And I know it doesn't work for everybody, but if you're, you know, if you're in a band and you're starting out and a record label comes by, tell them no, because any money that you're going to make has just been taken down by two thirds. Sorry. So uh, you said you're a theory nerd, and I wanted to know if you learn technique as well as theory at the same time, and if knowing theory, you think, I don't know if you learn it at the same time, but if you did, did it help you writing songs more fluently in the workflow? Because for myself, I don't know theory at all, like nothing. So when I'm trying to write songs, I spend ages and ages and ages trying to get out that vibe I have in my head and then giving up until a few weeks later and then trying to catch up with what I was doing, because I didn't really know how to get those flavors out. Mm -hmm. But I th watching, obviously, Adam Neely and all that stuff on the internet, I was like, oh, if I knew that stuff, I think I could get it out there so much quicker. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, like, knowing theory doesn't make you a better songwriter or, or a better player. It's just, it's just something you know. The, the thing that theory does for me is that it gives me a starting point. Like, I, like for instance, if I want to write something in diatonic harmony, using diatonic harmony. I know there's seven notes that I can use. And it's actually crazy if you just take the seven notes of the C major scale and I play an A minor, there's a huge amount I can do with just those seven notes. A lot of chords, a lot of melodies, a lot of progressions. There's so much you can do. So it, it just instantly gives me a starting point. So I, I guess the good thing about knowing theory is that you don't get lost, generally. Um, you still get writer's block, and it's still never any, any easier to write music. But at least for me, it's like I've got a starting point. I'm not having to pluck the I'm not having to pluck the notes out of thin air. I'm not having to, you know, use my ear all the time to. Obviously, you still need to use your ear when you use theory. But it's like I'm not having to like play this note. It's like does that sound good? No, I'll play this note. Does that sound good? Kind of thing. Like there's 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 not as much of that. Um, so it's just a, a case of just having a foundation to work from. It's like, I guess, like trying to write, write music without knowing theory is like, you know, you're trying to work barren ground. Whereas if you know theory, a foundation's been laid and you, you only need to build a house on top of the foundation. It's still a lot of work, but at least you have a foundation. Yeah, it was quite interesting when we were sort of chatting before, though, you've got a physics background, is that right? Do you think that's helped with, so you were talking about waves earlier in harmon uh, harmonics. Do you think that that really has helped with your understanding of certain theory and certainly the way that the relationship within notes can work. I mean, all that means is that I'm a, I'm a big freaking nerd. Um, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> no, I just, uh, I, I've always loved learning things. And I think, you know, having, you know, a science-based mind helps with music in some ways. I mean, it doesn't help with creativity, but it helps with, you know, trying to understand concepts and trying to, you know, conceptualize things and trying to make sense of a lot of difficult concepts. I think it's helped it with that. Yeah, I like the idea of the sort of a solid foundation and then sort of working up from that. That's great. Yeah, sorry, what was your question? Yeah, I was wondering, in the early days of Cassini, how did you sort of uh, get yourself to build a following? Did you make forum posts and social media or...? Yeah, so like, you know, back then, um, I wasn't on Instagram, I was on Twitter. Uh, there was a, for a forum called sevenstring.org where I actually met, I met artists like Pliny and, you know, Misha Mansur from Periphery was posting on Seven String back then as well. Um, there, was an, there was another forum, the, the Andy Sneap metal forums, but every time I posted there, they said my mixes were shit, so I just stopped posting there. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I posted shared music there. You know, I posted on Facebook. I remember the good old days. I had 72 likes. And then after I released Cassini, I got to 290 likes. I was like, yeah, I've, I've made it. I've, I've got so many Facebook likes now. Um, but yeah, it was, just, it was just sharing stuff and, you know, people picked it up. I was, there, there is always an element of luck. I mean, I was lucky because when I released music, there wasn't, the market wasn't as saturated. Uh, Facebook organic reach wasn't as god-awful as it is now. Um, so there, there, were, there were some factors with luck, but 
in essence, the the principles is still the same. You put out music, and if people dig it, they'll you know they'll like it, they'll share it, they'll come to the shows. I mean, it happened recently with a band called Archie Echo, who kind of came out of nowhere, released a single, and suddenly you know they're they're doing headline shows, and a lot of people are talking about them. You know, it can happen. Um, just you know, make make music that you like, and if other people happen to like it, you know, you have a the, the best foundation for that. And also. Um were there any sort of breakthrough moments where you realized, so I can make a career out of this? Yeah, I mean, um, I think Cassini, uh, sorry, not Cassini, Set Course and Andromeda, that album was like the thing that made me realize that, you know, I just want to do this full time. Um, I, wasn't having a, I wasn't having a good time at my old job, mainly because it was sucking away the time, the free time I had to do music. So working on that album was probably the biggest struggle I've had musically because when you're starved of the time to actually commit yourself to it, it's, it's I think any, anybody who, everybody here who's, you know, working or has something that gets in the way of doing music, it's the most frustrating thing when you want to just express yourself. Um, so that entire album, that entire process of writing that album, the, the, you know, I've literally had songs that I put off for months because I just couldn't get back to working on them. Um, so like, you know, the, sec, the, sec, the, 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 the second full track, uh, Constance Variables, that song was about nearly a year old by the time the album came out. Like that's how long I was working on some of that stuff. Um, so I feel like you know, releasing that album, having a catharsis of having all that, all those months of work finally being done, and then realizing that you know, enough people are listening to this and enough people are buying this that I can maybe take a risk and leave my job. And you know, the 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 baseline for me is like, I want to pay my bills and maybe eat a little. If I could do that, I'm doing okay. So, but I was just I was just so incredibly fortunate that enough people that enough people supported me that I could, you know, eat two maybe if I was lucky three meals a day. So that that was good. So I was I was really happy with that. And like you know, just b being a full time musician just means you have the time to dedicate your day to doing something that can help you musically. So like I said, I'm learning piano. I'm learning theory. I'm trying to get better at some of my mixes. So I have the time. I have that's been afforded to me, and it all goes into making the best music I can make. Yeah, just at the front here, guys. Hi, yeah, what's your question? Hi, I just wanted to ask you about your guitars. So what's your take on like the new stuff, incremental innovation or architectural innovation, whatever happening with like the true temperament frets and the Evertune bridge and the fan frets? Or you're just a fan of the classic, you know, imperfect guitar, you know, like the guitar, the imperfect instrument it is. You just prefer that, or you like, want to go into Evertune, True Temperament, Fan Frets, and the weird neck shape of the Strandberg guitars thingy, which is happening. So what's your take on that? I'm a, I'm, when it comes to guitars, I'm a very simple man. I, I like to hit the strings, and I like the notes to come out the way I want them to. Um, I mean, the, the way I see it, like, this guitar, these guitars are as incredible instruments as you're going to get. Anything you do to them, like putting two true temperament frets on by putting an Evertune bridge on, it's like, I already feel that you're way past the point of diminishing returns. Um, but th that's my personal take on it, because I, like, I still play a Strat with an action three times as high as that guitar, and I'll still bloody well enjoy it, um, because I just adore that guitar and the way it feels. For some players, they want the feel of fan frets. They want the feel of you know, the, the sort of Strandberg neck. They want the stability that, you know, the Aristides bodies provide. They want, you know, they want the true temperament. They want everything to be in tune to like the scent. Um, so it's just about player preference and your sort of tolerance for things being a bit off. Like uh, my, 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 like my, my strings were probably way out of tune and I couldn't hear it, but I was like, oh yeah, this sounds good. This is fine. I was probably destroying it all of your ears out there. Um, yeah, it's just a case of pers personal preference and your personal tolerance for what you think is like what you think you need in order to express yourself fully. And for me, you know, a guitar with you know, a block of wood with metal on it, mostly. Any other questions? Yes. Hiya. Uh, do you edit your guitars, guitar recordings a lot, or do you prefer to re record until you get a perfect take? Um, I try to get the best organic take possible. So if it means I have to sit there for three hours and keep trying it, I will do that. Um, but like, when, when, when it comes to editing guitar takes, that's, 
that's like a that's a production decision. So it's like, do I want this part to sound precise and like machine like, or do I want do I want people to hear every single bit of string noise in between the notes? And that de that depends, and like that can differ in the same song. So in that first song I played, there are riffs where I'm not cutting anything out, and you're hearing all the imperfections in the take, which I thought was the best take that I could have done. And then there's a riff where I cut out all the noise in between because that's the effect I was going for. So, like this is I, I said something similar about how people adhere to genre types and productions like production sort of stereotypes and stuff like that. And for me, it's just like, just why not both? Just pick everything that works. So like if your song has to be in the first minute, it's like a super tight riff and you want it to be precise and you want it to sound clean and you want, you want that sort of, yeah, you want that super tight sound, by all means, edit the hell out of it. And then the, 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 the ending section is like super open-ended and like there's lots of, you know, long flowing notes and you want, you want to hear everything then like, you know, leave it open, don't edit it. It just, um, the, the way I see it, all fair is in love and, all fair, all's fair in love and recording. So when you're recording, do whatever you need to get the best sounding record. That's the best expression of the music you want to create. Hi, um, so I just wanted to ask, since you've been doing this for quite a long time, I'm sure you've got um, some amount of hindsight of how things all build up for you, like YouTube, Spotify, like all the streaming, so things. Do you believe in uh, a few years, like with uh, YouTube and Spotify, as artists tend to get paid in fractions of peanuts, that there might be some kind of uh, platform that is literally just for music, where the musician actually gets paid a fair amount of money without having to be necessarily a sale in itself? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll believe anything, because even in the last five, ten years. I mean, Spotify wasn't around ten years ago. I think, I think ten years ago, people were still using LimeWire or Napster, you know. Um, that's, that's one thing, a slight aside, but, like, streaming has, like, almost killed music piracy, which is incredible. I think, uh, well, I can't be as definitive, but I feel like, especially in a lot of places where streaming is readily available, it's, it's impacted piracy a lot. Um, but, like, like I said before, a lot, of the, a lot of the unfairness when it comes to seeing... Like, I see the numbers that people produce for what they get per stream of, of Spotify revenue, for instance. And then I compare it to my own. And, like, what I'm getting is so much more than what I'm getting, what they're getting. And then I look at the difference between me and that artist. Then I realize they're on a label. They're on management. They're, 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 labels can, like, often say this is the percentage of things you get from sales. But they make their own rules up when it comes to for, for, for streaming. So then they might see like the tiniest percent. So you're getting a tiny fraction of a cent per stream, which is then fractionated even further by a label. Um, so you'd be surprised to hear, but like a lot of my month, a lot of my income comes from streaming services like Spotify, Google Play, Apple Music. They actually provide a decent income because I've hit a, like a number of monthly plays that it's actually turned into a decent amount of money, because it's just about you know, the amount of streams. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 think, I think we're kind of already there. It's just people need to change their own business models to adapt to what that's providing them. Because what they're saying is, if you work with, you know, if you work to, with Spotify directly, and you're getting X amount of streams per month, you're actually entitled to this amount of money, and you're not seeing that because you're on a label, or you're, you know, your, manage, your management's taking this, or whatever. Um, the, it's kind of there already, like I said. It's just about grabbing the opportunity. Um, do I want more money per stream? Do I want more you know, ad revenue on YouTube and stuff like that? It's like, yeah, sure. But a lot of people are trying to do what I'm doing. And the fact that I'm in, I'm in the position that I'm in because of the services that are already there, um, I'm grateful for it. And more people can take advantage of it. But I mean, who's to know? In five years, there might be a whole new set of services because that's just the rate of change of technology. So the other thing is I, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. You know, I'm not saying that I want to have all my money from one platform. I want to make sure that I'm getting income from lots of different platforms and just kind of make myself a little bit future-proof as well. Thanks. Hi again. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask, with the whole anime thing, like how 
do you take inspiration from anime, like, into your music? Because, like, I know there's this one band I listened to where they took a bit of a melody from, like, the OST, and then they made that the basis for the whole song. So how do you take inspiration from anime and whatnot? And also, what's your favorite anime? Um, so the, the, the answer to the second question is probably Cowboy Bebop. Um, uh, as opposed to how I take inspiration from anime, like, it's in the music. Like, there are things that are ever present in anime music that are, you know, there are very sort of obvious songwriting cues, very obvious, you know, compositional cues that you can take into your music. So what I did was, I'm still gonna write a metal instrumental guitar album, but I'm just gonna use those compositional cues. And anybody who's heard any anime music or watched anime will recognize that immediately. So I'm not doing anything like, I'm not doing anything revolutionary. I'm just taking the compositional cues from anime, like, you know, very simple but catchy melodies, certain chord progressions, um, certain tempos, certain feels, certain vibes. I'm just taking those and I'm incorporating into that, incorporating into what I already have with our own music. And uh, funny you should say that because I'm actually going to play two songs from Senpai EP2 to, to finish Yay. off. Yeah, so neatly uh, leads into that. Please give it up. Thank you very much, guys. So I'd say a big thank you to CT. That's amazing. Thanks very much.